Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the 27th Annual National Security Conference here at Duke Law School. And I am super pleased to have our, our next speaker, our General Larry Spencer, who is a, is a friend of many years and, and frankly, one of the people that I looked up to during my military career. Uh, General Spencer, uh, uh, I want to dive into a lot of things, but uh, and we've asked our audience to look through individuals' bios so that we can spend most of our, our limited time uh, talking to our speakers. Uh, but it is amazing to me to realize that you spent 44 years. Uh, I spent 34 years, and I like to, I've had many opportunities to tell, because relatively speaking that's long, lots of people that, uh, hey, you know, you served 25 years, you're a short timer. But I guess <laughs> I'm a short timer in, uh, in your relative to you. Uh, and I do want to talk about the book. Uh, and I think if you, those of you in the audience that haven't had a chance to read it, I think you're going to end up doing a lot of what, what I do of highlighting different things, because there is a lot of life lessons in here that, and I think what's brilliant about General Spencer's book, and this is something I complain about other people's book, other people have books that have good ideas in them, but they're not accessible. They're not presented in a way that's accessible to everybody. You have to already be an expert, but this is something that, that you really need to, um, need to read. And it's the official conference uh, speaker's gift, I might add. And so, you know, we're really pleased to, to have you here, sir. Um, let me, because it's just on everybody's mind, uh, you know, the crisis in the Ukraine, we are going to get to the book and lots of other things, but do you have any thoughts about it? And particularly because your background so much is in budget and financial management and so forth, do you have any thoughts about that? How, how it generally, but also specifically, is this going to impact DOD's bud budget, especially with things like rising fuel costs and so forth? What, what do you think, or is, are we kind of immune from that? Yeah, great question, because obviously that's uh, relevant right now. And uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And uh, it's a great program. Uh, I've read a lot about it. So thank you so much for, for having me. Um, yeah, you know, I think like most Americans, um, I'm just sick about what's going on, you know, to watch uh, a sovereign nation be overrun, uh, you know, sort of a David and Goliath uh, situation uh, play out right in front of us is, is uh, disheartening to me. Um, so I'm, I, you know, I, 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 I'm, I really feel for the folks of Ukraine right now uh, and hope that they can figure out a way to, to bring this to some sort of rapid end, uh, particularly the violence uh, that's going on. Uh, but absolutely, a, a war uh, has impacts globally, um, you know, not to mention fuel prices, uh, the stock market uh, impact on the stock market. Um, it, it, you know, our, we have we live in a global economy. And so whenever there's a disruption like this, uh, it affects us all. So I think the president mentioned, you know, we can probably expect uh, gas prices to go up even even more. I was at the gas station the other day and filled up my car. So I know exactly what that looks like already. I did um, that too. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that's not any fun, uh, but it, it could get a little worse. Uh, again, I, I'm just sick about the fact that, uh, you know, as a, uh, as a, as a global uh, world, we're all humans. The fact that we have to resort to violence against one another, I think it's uh, really unfortunate. Uh, it, it, interesting, I think it could have some impacts clearly on the DOD budget, uh, frankly, because I think most Americans are fairly complacent uh, about the military. There, there are less and less folks in Congress that serve. Uh, back during, uh, you know, World War I, World War II coming forward, even to Vietnam, the Korean War, if you stop someone on the street, they had a cousin, aunt, uncle, father, mother, sister, brother in the military. Uh, that is no longer the case. And as you know, uh, there's less than 25 percent of our population that's even eligible to join the military. And then a small subset of those actually serve. And so most Americans don't even understand the military, don't know what it's about. 
uh, and don't know how critical it is for the military to have the best equipment, the best training to go along with the best people uh, so that we can protect ourselves and protect our, our allies and our interests. Um, so I, I think depending on what happens, it certainly could have an effect. I suspect it will be simply because it rages the consciousness uh, of Americans, rages the consciousness of those on the Hill that, you know, this, we are, we, we are in a dangerous world and, and we have to really be prepared. We don't want to have to go to war or defend ourselves, but we certainly have to be prepared to do so. So certainly could have an impact and I suspect that it will. If you were the J8 today, would you be heading over to the Hill and looking for a supplemental or, or things like that? I mean, yeah, maybe absolutely. we should explain to <laughs> the audience, what, what is the J8 and, sure, and what do yeah. I mean by a supplemental? Sure, yeah, it's so, um, yeah. <laughs> I thought I'd gotten away from acronyms when I left the military. I really haven't. Everyone's, I'm sure Duke has, you have your acronyms as well. Um, but the J-8 is just, uh, it's just an office symbol, if you will, or a description for an office in, on the joint staff that handles all of the resources for the entire department. Um, and so, for example, it's, it's, you know, you have a J-1 that's personnel and you have a J-2 that's intel and so on. The J-8 happened to be a, a job I had when I was there as a three-star. Uh, and we were responsible for the resources for the entire Department of Defense. So clearly, uh, yeah, it, that was one of the fascinating parts about the job. You know, I got to do a lot of time on the Hill, uh, working behind the scenes, which I found interesting, mainly because when you get in the room with uh, members of Congress, the conversation is a lot different than when you get on national TV. Uh, and so it's very behind the closed doors. It's very civil. It's very focused. It's very serious. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, sometimes when you have a hearing and it's on TV, you know, politics come in, you know, come into play and, you know, uh, uh, folks are looking for sound bites that they can play back to constituents. So it gets a little bit different. But uh, yeah, but so that's what I would be doing probably as we speak, uh, talking about uh, supplementals, what's going to happen, what do we need to do, what are, what are our shortfalls, what have we deployed forward to, to reinforce NATO, what do we now need to backfield that we sent forward to NATO. So yeah, it, it would be a, it's a pretty exciting time right now. Yeah, and it, it does kind of remind me, uh, we're gonna talk about Dark Horse, but this is not your first book, it's your <laughs> second book. Tell us a little bit about that first book. And I ha actually have a, a question that I wanna to pose sure. to you, but tell us a little bit about that book. Yeah, my first book, uh, it's called The Green Eye Shades of War. And I wrote the book for several reasons. First is, in my experience as a financial manager in the military, I, I, I discovered uh, in, in real time how important uh, money is to war. You, you don't win a war without money. Uh, and when you deploy forward, as we did, for example, when I was at Seymour Johnson uh, for Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm, everything had to be bought. I mean, you, you, know, you land, in, land in, a, in a foreign country uh, in a bear base situation. And you're talking about buying everything from showers to food, uh, to fuel, uh, to equipment. I mean, it, it was, it was a massive expense of money and, but, but, uh, uh, you know, contrary to popular beliefs and you know, better than I, the appropriation rules don't go away during a war. So, so, you know, we, so I was, by the way, for your students as the comptroller, I was hand in hand with my lawyer, uh, the whole time. <laughs> You know, making sure right. that we didn't do anything wrong, and and, and as you can imagine, the contracts uh, that we had to to write and sign. Uh, by the way, an interesting anecdote. One of the things we did not expect, because initially we were in uh, Saudi Arabia, was the culture of of the Saudis was they would not do business, financial business with women, uh, and that was a problem for us uh, because my accounting and finance officer was a woman. Uh, uh, and so it was, you know, na navigating through that, uh, having to purchase a bias for all the women that deployed so, so they could go outside the gate. Uh, again, all of these things, uh, you know, uh, something nobody really thought about. <laughs> what I found interesting, and I, I don't know if your students know what a BX or a PX is, but it's the exchange store that, that are on military installations. Um, and uh, th th those things show up everywhere. So if, if you go to a war, I don't care how remote it is a BX or a PX will show up. Uh, but in our case, we couldn't get change over there. We could not get, we could not get coins through customs. Uh, and so we had to devise a plan, what we, something we call pucks, 
uh, that were actually little cardboard cutouts. And again, I was hand in hand with my lawyer because we could not call them currency legally. Uh, so we had to call them, you know, officially gift certificates. But we would give folks back gift certificates like 25 cents, 10 cents is change. So these are the things you have to, you know, work your way through. Uh, but so I just I went all the way back to World War II and worked my way forward. And I found the same challenges that financial managers had in World War II, we had in Desert Storm. And that was frustrating for me. It seems like we never learned those lessons. So that's the reason I wrote it. I, you know, and, and it was sort of just that whole financial management during war was just fascinating to me. Well, it, it is to me too. And I think it's, it's a reminder of something that you mentioned earlier. I don't know how it's, I bet you this has been the same thing for you because when I, I tell people I was in the Air Force and the first thing they say, well, were you a pilot? And I go, no, I was a lawyer. They have lawyers? The lawyers <laughs> in the military? Right. I don't, have you run into any of that? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's uh, and, and especially for you and I who got, who are fortunate enough to be general officers, there's an assumption that we're pilots. Um, and, and yeah, you know, the, the military, the Air Force, it is just like, uh, you know, a base is like a city. Uh, you know, a wing commander is like a mayor. And you've got, you know, we've got finance, got personnel, you have folks picking up trash, you got folks cutting grass. Uh, it, it is like a little city. And the military is self, it's almost self-contained. I mean, we have lawyers, we have nurses, doctors, you know, financial managers, personnel, maintenance, uh, civil engineers, you, you name that it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, in fact, what's interesting is, you know, less than 10% of the population of the Air Force are pilots. But it's, it's that other 90% that allow pilots to do what they do. Let me ask you a, a question that is, I don't know if it's actually true. You can, you can uh, disabuse me of this, but it seems to me that during a, one of the deployments, the, there was for MWR purposes. There was something about sumo wrestler. <laughs> is this story, is this leg, is this Larry Spencer legend true or is it you know apocryphal? This is that is absolutely true. <laughs> so, so, so and I've got it documented. Um, so uh, what happened was we when when we were during Desert Shield Desert Storm. If you recall back, there was a large buildup of forces. Uh, over a, a couple of months, and as the and as the United States moved forces and equipment forward, wing commanders, not just wing commanders, all commanders in the theater, had a challenge. You know, keeping their troops, you know, keeping the morale up and giving them finding something for them to do. And one of the most popular things was to dress up uh, in a sumo wrestling suit. If you can remember the old Michelin Man commercial, yeah. that's what they looked like. And they, they would dress up in these suits, get in the ring, and just knock each other around for, you know, five or ten minutes. It was very popular, and everyone loved it. The controversy was we used, back in, back to my lawyer friend, we used appropriated money to buy it. And the auditors went over, uh, you know, the reputation of auditors, they kind of shoot the wounded after the war is over. <laughs> but the, the auditors go over, you know, kind of when the war is winding down and say, wait a minute, you bought sumo wrestling suits and you shouldn't have. You should have used not appropriated funds to do that. And so we went around and around and finally, you know, proved to them that we were legal. Uh, but yeah, the sumo wrestling suit legend is true. That, that went all the way up. As you think about this, we're in a war and something like sumo wrestling suits goes all the way up to Congress. Unbelievable. Well, I think what's so interesting, and I, I think maybe interesting to a lot of our students in the audience, because we have a lot of a lot of people who are interested in national security writ large, but but they also have a passion for finance and and you know that side of thing. They don't necessarily you know want to you know be be the pilot or right. or they don't they're not they don't feel suited to be an infantryman or something like that. And right. I think it, it's helpful for them to know that there are these other kinds of opportunities in this, in this city that, that you talk about. Let's uh, I want to get back to some of those issues. And uh, uh, I was going to tell a war story about how we justified having appropriated funds, coffee. In, <laughs> right. In, right. In yeah. the, in the, uh, 
in the Air Operations Center, you would think it, that'd be an easy thing. No, it wasn't. That's we correct. had to create a an entity of the DFAC. That's correct. To to make it make it work. Um, and also, I think a lot of people and even troops and especially our allied partners and that's what i'd like to ask you about in just a few minutes you know your familiarity with the financial options that our allies have when we're in a joint operation versus what we have we, we seem to be uh, more challenged than they are they seem to have a lot more flexibility um, i don't know if you want to comment on that now or yeah i, th I think that's right and uh, again when we I think there's this myth it, it, when you go to war, so the rules go out of the window and, and they really don't. Uh, give you an example. And the reason this is on the front of my mind is you remember General Ed Rice. Yeah. Um, I had him speak to my staff uh, last week uh, for Black History Month. And it reminded me, uh, again, during, during Operation Enduring Freedom, this was shortly after 9-11, and we, there was a, a pretty intense bombing campaign in Afghanistan. And that bombing campaign was led by uh, a commander, a friend of both Charlie and ours, uh, Ed Rice, a retired four star. He was a colonel at the time, and he was the commander on a small island in the middle of the Indian Ocean called Diego Garcia. There's nothing else there. Um, and you would, you'd have a hard time finding it on the map. But that's where all of the bombers went forward, the B-2s, B-52s, B-1s, and they operated off of that tiny island. Well, uh, and Charlie, you'll appreciate this. I'm at Langley sitting in my headquarters office. I get a call from Ed Rice. And he tells me that the, the folks who owned the island, it wasn't the Air Force, uh, they, had, they had rules that allowed them to get free haircuts. Again, th this is crazy. This is in the middle of a bombing campaign allowed them to get free haircuts and free newspapers. Don't ask me why. And so he and his troops, his Air Force troops, were asking him for the same thing. But by God, you know, if everybody else around here can get a free haircut, I want one too. Uh, and so, again, I'm sitting in Langley Air Force Base, uh, you, know, you know, trying to get money over to the war, and he's asking about haircuts. And again, I had to go up to the Pentagon. Uh, we had to talk to the JAG in the Pentagon. It was unbelievable. But, yeah, absolutely. So, again, that, that complicates it because when we deploy forward, uh, particularly with allied forces uh, or, or, even other, or even other services in a joint environment, some of their rules are interpreted different than ours. And, and, and having the lawyer sort out that interpretation is really pretty interesting. Yeah, that, it's bringing back so many memories. Uh, but let's, let's talk about... Uh, let's talk about your book, and I want to make sure everybody knows sure. where it is uh, and what it's called. And um, it's it's called Dark Horse, uh, General Lario Spencer, and its journey from the horseshoe to the Pentagon. People are may wonder, what's the horseshoe? Let's sure. Yeah, so the horseshoe, I, I grew up in uh, it's southeast D.C. It was 46th place. Um, and it's the street itself is shaped like a horseshoe. And so when, as I grew up, it was, it wasn't referred to as 46 place Southeast. It was for, referred to as a horseshoe. And so most folks in DC knew what that, what the name of that, that name stood for. Um, but yeah, I, I grew up in the inner city. Um, uh, and again, interesting, uh, environment, as you can imagine back in, the, uh, fifties, uh, late fifties, sixties. Uh, you know, interesting upbringing for me, you know, not a very good uh, school system, et cetera. So a lot of things I had to deal with uh, growing up in an in, inner city uh, on the horseshoe. One of the most, the most shocking thing in your book to me personally was that you say you weren't a good student <laughs> and that doesn't match up with the, uh, the general Larry Spencer that I know. And, uh, and in fact, I want to tell you a war story when we start talking about mentors and our mutual mentor, mentor uh, General Hornberg, who I hope is watching. But you, you, is that really true? Were, were you not, not a good student? That, that is absolutely true. It, it's, it's, I was actually talking to my sister uh, last night about this, uh, because I was a terrible student. The, the, the school system itself was not very good. Uh, I'll just say that up front. Uh, um, you know, it, the schools were crowded, uh, textbooks, you know, not in very good shape. 
uh, and I essentially got passed along from grade to grade. Um, and I, you know, again, I, 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 I'm not blaming it on the school. It, it was my fault. Um, uh, uh, but I, I didn't have the, although my parents were great. So I want to be clear with that. I had great parents, but you know, my mother had not at the time, she hadn't graduated from high school herself. Uh, my, my father was a soldier in the army. And so I didn't have some of the, uh, uh, you know, homeschooling, if you will, prep that I probably wish I would have had or in hindsight. Uh, but I, I, I can tell you what, what, what I was talking to my sister about was after I got in the Air Force and I started to take college courses, the light bulb just switched on. Uh, and I became a lifelong learner. I mean, you know, and, and I love learning now. I, I don't know why, how I went from dark to light uh, in that regard. But I love learning, uh, you know, love going to school, uh, you know, any opportunity I get to learn or take a course. Uh, uh, and, you know, my goal is to if any cor- course I'm in, my goal is to earn an A, not because I want to w- walk around saying I got an A, but because I want to master the learning environment uh, because I-, I just really enjoy learning. So, yes, uh, you, w- what was in the book is true or what is in the book is true. Well, I'll, I'll share with you a little uh War story uh, from General Hornberg, uh, who who we I think sure. heard to say we ment- mentored both of us, and probably yes. we wouldn't be wearing stars but for his uh, his mentorship. I remember I was talking to him about some issue, and it, it I don't know if it was a contract or some financial issue, and um, I said said something like, "Well." do you want me to go to, uh, you know, the Pentagon or something about this? And he said, well, have you talked to Spencer yet? And I go, yeah, he, you know, we're on the same sheet. He said, well, I can't remember his exact words. He said, but well, if Spencer said it's, it's good or no good, uh, that's the end of it. And he kind of implied, honestly, that <laughs> you were a lot smarter than me. So, <laughs> He wasn't well, that, that interested was in my crea- creativity. Um, <laughs> no, that certainly was not the case. But yeah, I, uh, like you, I, I uh, and you know, I, I mentioned him in my, in my book because I have great admiration for him. Uh, he's, he's, he's a great leader, by the way, uh, great commander. Uh, but for whatever reason, and I'm very appreciative of it, you know, he, he became a mentor of mine and uh, throughout my whole career and, and after I retired. Um, so, yes, in fact, I uh, hope we uh, at some point we get to talk about mentors because uh, let's dive into that right now, sure. okay. uh, because, uh, uh, you know, young people, I think, still need mentors. And Absolutely. so I'd like to hear about your experience and maybe some ideas that you have for young people, especially minorities who are looking for mentors and sure. and how that might work. Yeah. So let me let me tell you a story from the book. Um about one of my mentors that were, was really instrumental in my career and my life. And by the way, my, my first mentors were my parents. So I want to, uh, I think that's really important. Sure. Uh, so now, <laughs> so I was kidding Charlie a few minutes ago, he was combing his hair and I, I mentioned <laughs> to him that I, I wish I could, I wish I had use for a comb again. I, I don't, I don't, <laughs> uh, but, um, but I, I'm, so I'm going to ask your uh, folks that are watching to use their imagination for a second, because you're really going to have to. Um, So I joined the uh, Air Force back in the early 70s, back during that time. And I'm sure those of you are old enough to have been, uh, you know, uh, at least teenagers back then. We'll remember the style was long hair. Um, And in the early mid 70s, I had an afro like you would not believe. I mean, it was it was just I remember I remember struggling playing football to get my helmet on over the over over my hair. Uh, And so when I joined the Air Force, of course, they shaved, cut everything off at basic training. But amongst my peers, now, now look, and I'm looking, in hindsight now, I wouldn't have done this. It was, it was an immature thing to do. <laughs> but all my friends, we pushed the envelope on how long we could grow our hair in uniform. And I hate to admit this, but for this type of hair that African-Americans have, there was a trick of, you know, uh, sort of wearing a stocking cap at night, packing it all down. Uh, as, as tight as you could, and then sort of, you know, kind of get, you know, getting kind of close to the standards and people will kind of leave you alone. Again, in hindsight, should I have done that? No, but I did. So anyway, make a long story short. Um, I, I, w- I was stationed in Taiwan for a year when I was 19 years old uh, at CCK in, in uh, Taiwan. Yeah. 
I made a bet with my friends that I could, we could go a year without getting a haircut. Again, this is crazy in hindsight, but that's what we did. I was 19 years old. Give me, you know, so cut me some slack. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so I went a year without a haircut. That's on top of the long hair I already had. So I remember when I was leaving Taiwan, I got an assignment to Whiteman Air Force Base. And, and Charlie, you remember that. Let me make sure you're, you're, the watchers understand. I got an assignment to Whiteman, which was Strategic Air Command at the time. And my friends just they started laughing because they said, you know, for those of you who don't know, Strategic Air Command was the, the command that handled the strategic forces for the military, the bombers in the, in the, in the Air Force. It was a serious, by the book, spit and polish command it was and it had that sort of reputation and so they just knew that when i got to whiteman air force base that was going to be the end of my uh you know sort of keeping up with 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 my peers in terms of hair length so make a long story short i got there long hair in fact it was so long i got i know it's hard to believe now my wife would braid my hair on on the weekend <laughs> <laughs> and so uh so uh, we we were out late one night didn't have a chance to pack my hair down. Here I am in uniform. I was a two striper. I go to work and I'm there early and I, my hair is all over the place. I don't know why I did it. I guess I'll just chalk it up to being 19. And so I'm sitting there in my office wondering what's going to happen when my boss walks in. I'm sitting in my office and I can, I'm looking right at the door and a chief master sergeant. And for those of you who don't know who, what that is, it's the highest enlisted grade in the Air Force. E9, Chief Master Sergeant. A Chief Master Sergeant walked by the door, looked in, and I looked up and I was, you know, kind of scared, but he went on by. And I kind of wiped my brow and said, wow, I'm glad I got away with that one. And this was before Michael Jackson made this popular. But this Chief Master Sergeant literally moonwalked back, back and, looked in, and looked at me and said, you have got to be kidding me. He said, get up from your chair and come with me. Uh, Chief, you know, my boss is coming in, get up from your chair and come with me. So I got up, uh, I followed him outside and Charlie, maybe, you know, the answer to this, you can tell me later if you do every chief master sergeant I've known has had a pickup truck. I don't know why, but they all had pickup trucks. So I got, I got his pickup truck. We went over to the base barber shop. He paid the barber. He sat down in the chair and said, give him a military haircut. And so as I, if I, as I sit there watching my hair fall on the floor, uh, he, he had a big smile on his face. And so after that, he put me in his truck and I assumed he would take me back to work. And so he said, do you have a minute? I want to, and don't worry about your boss. I'll take care of that. Let me, let's go, let's go over to base, the base park. And so we went over to the park and we got out the truck, sit at a picnic table. And he saw at, talking to me in a way probably that no one else ever had. He said, what are you doing? You know, what are you doing with your life? You know, I, he said, I've seen you around the base. You seem like you're pretty sharp. You know, you, I, I can tell you're doing a good job. But look, you, you're in the Air Force. And he said, look, I was young once. I get it. And if you want to get out of the Air Force and grow your hair long, have at it. But while you're in the Air Force, you need to follow the Air Force rules and you need to be the airman that we need you to be. And, you know, I, again, that just, he had such an impression on me. And then he said to me, he said, well, are you planning to get out of the Air Force after four years? I said, yeah. Yeah. By the way, everybody said that. Uh, it was just something, the thing to say. Uh, I didn't know whether I was get, going, to, going to separate or not. Uh, and so he said, well, why aren't you taking college courses? He said, the worst thing you can do is go through four years and leave with nothing. The Air Force is offering, offering you all these opportunities for travel, for experience, for education. He said, take advantage of it. I said, yes, Chief, you're right. He said, I don't want to hear, yes, Chief, you're right. He said, get back in the truck. We got in the truck and he took me to the base education office and, and we signed up. He and I, he, we signed up for college courses on the spot. And from that point forward, uh, he, hang, he, he stuck with me as I started taking more and more college courses. As I mentioned, the education light bulb turned on. I found out I was as smart as anybody else. I found out I, I just didn't know how to study. I loved it. Uh, and that led to my degree and getting a commission. Um, but that chief stayed with me even after he retired. He would call me every once in a while. How you doing? You know, is everything going okay? Wow. I'm just telling you, if you don't have mentors, uh, you need to get one. By the way, I'm going to say this, and I'm not saying it because he's on the screen. 
if you don't have Charlie Dunlap as one of your mentors, uh, you know, you, you got, you're missing something because I, I certainly have him as one of mine. Uh, by the way, just real quick, because I don't want to, I know we, we're running short. We, we don't have a lot of time. A mentor doesn't need to know their mentor. You can find folks you admire. It's not about trying to emulate or be like them, but folks that you like and you admire, uh, you know, just kind of tr track them and see how they operate. For me, my first sort of unofficial mentor was Colin Powell. Uh, you know, that guy burst on the scenes, uh, and I, do, I was like, wow. Uh, and so I, I met him years later, and we became friends. But I, I told him he was a mentor for me long before we ever met. And so if you don't have mentors yet, uh, a lot of them, I recommend you do so as, as soon as you can. Yeah, Colin Powell was, I, I had a chance to meet him one time uh, to get an award. And the uh, just quick war story, he talked with me for about 10 minutes and then we went into the ceremony and he talked about me, the article, as if we were, had been drinking buddies for 20 years. And, um, and I, I really admired that capability. Uh, and I think it came from his years in, in command. And which brings me to something I, I want to ask you about two, two questions. One, uh, for someone in financial management, you actually had probably more than your share of major command opportunities. Uh, and I'd like you to talk about that and your experience. And it also, you experienced lawyers in two different capacities, one as a commander, and one as a staff officer. Uh, was that different? Uh, what qualities did you want to uh, uh, value and which qualities did you not like? Let's, let's talk first about uh, how valuable was your command? And, you know, you had a finance squadron, but you also had a group command. <laughs> right, right. And a wing command, which, right. which is qualitatively different, just so everybody uh, listening, a, a squadron, you know, might be uh, yeah, 100 people. But once you get, start getting into a group and a wing, you're talking thousands of people and not just right. uniform people, but civilians as well. Share with us a little bit about that. Yeah, they, you know, um, there are uh, great opportunities for leadership, both in the military and outside the military. But I haven't, and I've, I've experienced and am experiencing both. I have found nothing that compares to command uh, because it's more than being a supervisor or a leader of people. You know, you, you are, first of all, you in the military, you have uh, legal uh, responsibilities uh, over folks. Um, but a command in the military in particular, you, you know, you're responsible for good order and discipline. You're responsible for your unit being ready to go to, to go to war if they have to, uh, and 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 those responsibilities range everywhere from, you know, their living environment, the don't you know the the barracks if you will that they they live in, where they eat, where they sleep, their families uh, are really critical. Uh, so uh, it, it is a awesome and it, it is it is something that, uh, you know, when you get the opportunity to command the weight of it uh, is, is tremendous because it is such an honor and such a privilege uh, to, to be given the, the opportunity to uh, uh, sorry about that. Um, the awesome responsibility um, of just really being responsible for um, everything. I mean, and it's, it's, it's really, um, uh, almost hard to explain. Um, I, I, again, a quick story. When I was the commander at uh, Seymour Johnson as the Comptroller Squadron Commander, uh, again, it was financial, but we still deployed four folks to war. Uh, and just quickly, the first, uh, not to get folks too deeply in the military, but as airplanes deploy to a location, we refer to the numbers as chalks, like chalk number one is the first airplane, chalk number two is the second airplane, and, and so on. Deploying to Desert Storm or Operation Desert Shield initially, chalk number two, the second air airplane off the ground, had finance people on it. 
Uh, and I had a guy on that airplane, and these are the, this was before a lot of the uh, electronic funds transfer. I had a guy with a briefcase full of cash and checks. I mean, you would never do that today, but we did. And so, so I get up on the airplane with this guy, and it's, there's, there's, he's a master sergeant in E7. But then there's a, 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 a two-striper in E3, and he's sitting there, and he is scared to death. And he looks at me as his commander, and he says, sir, uh, are you coming with us? He said, I'd feel a lot better if you were coming with us. And I said, airman, I said, I've already volunteered. I said, I, I, as soon as I can get over there, I'll be there because I, I want to be there with my troops. And then he looked at me and he said, he said, I hope so, because I, we feel a lot better if you were coming with us. You don't, you don't find that in industry. Uh, it, it, this was more than being their boss. Uh, we, we had a connection and we were, we were in this together. Uh, and if they were going to war, I wanted to go and vice versa. Uh, and so command is a really unique privilege that again, only a few uh, get to experience. I do want to get second part of your question though. And I'm not saying this because I'm talking to uh, lawyers or at least potential lawyers, I, you know, lawyers inside and outside the military are invaluable period dot. Uh, now, as an example, in industry, uh, I'm on several public boards uh, on some pretty big companies. We, uh, we talk to our lawyer every board meeting. It, it's, it, we, in the military, you don't go far without your lawyer because so many things are wrapped up in some sort of law or requirement or UCMJ. Um, it, it, it's invaluable, uh, both as a commander and as a staff officer, as, as a vice chief of staff, uh, several times a week I met with the TJAG or I met with uh, other uh, folks on his staff because there were always legal issues flowing through my office that I had to say, wait a minute, I need a, I need a lawyer to help me work through this. So it was invaluable. By the way, you know, Charlie is, is, uh, is, is too humble uh, to tell you about himself, but think about Charlie Dunlap sitting in uh, what we call the chaos, but, but sitting in the, the, the hub uh, during Desert Storm, the hub of where all the operations are controlled out of. So you've got the commanders, folks you hear about on TV, maps, all kinds of computers all around, and they are controlling the entire war from this, uh, from this room. And as they decide what targets they're going to strike, if they decide what oper what, how they're going to implement their operations plan, they turned to Charlie Dunlap and said, okay, Mr. Lawyer, can we do this? Can we do that? What do you think? How does this work? What if we strike this? What's going to happen? What does the law say about that? Um, Charlie's too humble to talk about that, but nothing much moves without the lawyers. And, not be, that, and, and I don't mean that in a negative way, uh, because we are a nation of laws. Uh, and, and, it, and even if there's a war, we don't throw the laws out the window. And so, you know, laws... By the way, I, I've often been told I missed my calling that I should have been a lawyer because I, I like to argue so much. Uh, but but uh, but yeah, I, I, it's highly respected both in the military and out. So I, I you know if I could trade places with your students right now, I would do it in a heartbeat. Well, actually, you would have made a, a, a great lawyer, and I must say, nobody. It's pretty rare that anybody's accused me of being too humble, but <laughs> and actually my my first chaos experience was Desert Fox, and you'll appreciate this about General Hornberg. Uh, it's the first actual combat deployment I was with him. And you know, when you're in the chaos like that, the commander will talk to you in fighter fighter pilot speak. Right, right. And he swiveled around and asked me a question in fighter pilot speak. And by some miracle, I was able to answer it. And uh, he later told me that he would have fired me if I, A, hadn't answered it or B, got it wrong. <laughs> so commanders, uh, and one of the things, and I like your view of this, um, one of the things I tell young lawyers is that it's extremely important to understand the, the unit's business. The, you know, it's one thing to know, you gotta know the law, that's, that's an expectation. But if you really don't have your head in the business, you're not gonna be able to give informed legal advice. So has that been your experience or, or what's your view as the, as the client, so to speak? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, in fact, I had the same experience with then Colonel Hornberg as a wing commander because I was his comptroller. And the last thing he wanted to hear from me was about debits and credits. 
Uh, you know, he wanted to hear what he could buy, what he couldn't buy, what was legal, what was not legal. Um, and 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 I that's a pet peeve of mine because quite often, whether it's finance, whether it's lawyers, whether it's engineers, they want to talk to their bosses in that language. And by and by the way, your boss doesn't care about that language. And by the way, they shouldn't. Uh, it's it's not their job to understand the intricacies of law. They didn't go to law school. It's your job to interpret for them what they need to do to make decisions in their job. And you hit the nail on the head. You, you, when you're sitting around the table uh, with whether it's in industry or whether it's in the military, uh, it's the same. You aren't sitting there as, as someone with a law degree. I mean, obviously you, you are a lawyer and you have expert expertise in the law. You are a critical part of that or that staff. You are a critical part of that decision making, uh, and so and you so, you know, a CEO of a company doesn't need you, you know, spitting out, uh, you know, uh, the Constitution and, and and everything that's in it. What they need you to know is our job is to 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 make X or our job is to do this, and and I need your legal experience or expertise to help us do that. Um, and so I, I, that is, I mean, that's of anything we've talked about so far. I mean, I, I can't emphasize enough how critical that is because you, you take your experience as a lawyer into whatever industry or endeavor you go into, and now you become one. Uh, but, you know, you aren't sitting off in the corner, you know, uh, being lawyerly. You know, you're part of that, that decision-making um, uh, apparatus. We are running a little bit short of time, and, and I don't want to miss this opportunity. One of the things about uh, about your book, Dark Horse, that that you go into is what it was like, and you know, being a Black American working your way through uh, to become a one of the, I think nine, maybe four star Black four stars that we've had. Right, uh, and honestly, a lot of that in in the in the book was was surprising to me vis-a-vis -vis you because you you didn't wear wear stuff like that on your sleeve right, uh, right. it was always uh, but i don't want people think you had this charmed life and just you know <laughs> you joined the air force next thing you knew, knew you were vice chief of staff right you could share with us a little bit about that and if you have any thoughts for today and maybe how we can diversify our leadership more and, and so forth if you have any any thoughts on that yeah, good, good. That's a good question. So first of all, uh, 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 I appreciate you saying what you did because, yeah, I, I, um, I what I learned early on from my father, you know, when I used, he was in the army for t over 20 years, he joined the armies in the 40s and the army at that point wasn't even segregated. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry, integrated. It was segregated. Mm -hmm. And so when I heard him tell stories about what he went through, you know, I'm saying, OK, well, I, I, I'm not going to complain about that if, because he never complained. Um, you know, sometimes we, I think, and, and I hear this a lot today with all, you know, as divided as our country is and all the stuff that's going on. I think sometimes we forget as Americans that we are on a journey toward a more perfect union. We're not a more perfect union yet. And as all of, and all of us as Americans need to contribute toward that journey. Um, so I think it's important to, to understand we, we are on our way toward perfection. We probably never reach perfection, but we should continue to, to to, to make that journey. Uh, so just to specifically talk about sort of my experience as a African-American in, in the military or, or otherwise, let me just give you a, a, just a quick anecdote about, uh, anecdote about assimilation. Because when I got commissioned as a second lieutenant, uh, I was really excited. I'm an officer now, and I've heard about, you know, these social functions and all of that. And so uh, my wife and I, uh, or we get an invitation uh, to our first social function. And so First thing that happened, we get an invitation that says casual. No, I didn't know. Anything. Okay, casual. Casual for me was jeans, uh, you know, a sweat, you know, a sweatshirt. Now I didn't have on a sweatshirt, but I had on a pair of jeans, uh, or I did too. And so we're fortunately we we were in walking distance to the club. We lived on base, but as we walked to the club, the other folks who were attending, because we were the only African Americans there, had on a little bit different dress, which I I came to found was was officer casual. And you're familiar with that, you know, the Dockers, the, you know, golf shirt, the loafers. So I went, I went now, I didn't have any loafers, but I did, I did go home and I get a Goldman chain. 
So picture this. We go into the cl- officer's club. Only blacks in the club. That's okay. I mean, I'm not, that's not a complaint. Uh, but I had, I can't tell you the number of people that came up to me and asked me what my handicap was. I had no idea what they were talking about. Uh, because, you know, Southeast D.C. is known for a lot of things. Golf courses is not one of them. Uh, but there was this assumption that we play golf. Uh, and so, you know, most of the night they were telling about greens and, you know, uh, roughs. And I, I, we were just completely, uh, you know, uh, just had no idea. So as the evening progressed, and, and I want to be clear here up front, I have nothing against country music. Uh, I think it's great. But growing up in, in Southeast, you don't hear country music. And so the country music starts cranking up and everybody's having a good time. And my wife and I look at each other. You know, trying to understand because they're singing these songs and we, we that we've never heard of before. And, you know, conversations getting into politics and all sorts of things. Uh, and, and my point is not that that's because that would happen, whether it's in the, in the military or in IBM or or Amazon, it doesn't matter. But this notion of assimilation and coming from a culture like I did was which, which almost completely African-American into a broader culture was quite an adjustment. And the, 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 the challenge is how do you assimilate into this culture without losing who you are uh, in your personal culture? So it was, it was quite a challenge. I, again, not a complaint. Uh, I, I'll say up front, I mean, the, the military is not a racist organization, so that wasn't the issue. Uh, the, the issue is just how do I now fit into this uh, culture so that I can be successful? Uh, and, and again, that's something I think uh, that a lot of us uh, have to deal with women, I think in particular, uh, who go into a male-dominated organization, have to figure out, you know, how do I navigate navigate this? So, yeah, interesting. Uh, again, no complaints, uh, but certainly something that unless you ask me, you probably would never know. You mentioned your lovely wife, Aura, and I think we both agree uh, that I mean, my wife, Joy, and Joy and Aura know each other, uh, that they really are the secret to our success. Uh, you've been, and we are running short of time, but, but you've been involved, especially in your, after leaving uh, the Air Force and during your periods, you know, looking after the families and the work-life balance and so forth. Uh, how important is that? Uh, we think it is, but it, the military presents some unique challenges, I think, for the work-life balance. You have any it does. Yes. things it to does. share? Yeah, I, uh, millennials... Uh, when I speak to them as a group, that's the first question that always comes up, work-life balance. And particularly in the, hopefully, aftermath of the pandemic, where so many folks started working from home and got used to more time at home, uh, sort of trying to navigate how our way forward is a challenge for most employers right now. Uh, I, I, but I, I like to refer to work-life balance as work-life choice, because as you know, in the military, there are times when you don't have a choice. Um, you know, if they t- if they say, "Hey, uh, General Dunlap, we need you to go," you know, to to, to Poland tomorrow. Um, you're going to go to Poland tomorrow, and if you stay for six months or a year, you're going to stay for six months or a year. And so, not not a lot of work life balance there. Um, and as you know, again, things come up. You know, uh, there are deadlines in the Pentagon, and sometimes you have to work late or work weekends. Um, but here's the key, I think. Because I think most folks think of work-life life balance as an even sort of teeter-totter, and I don't think it is. I think it goes up and down. Uh, and so I, the way I try to balance that is when I need to surge, I surge. When I don't need to surge, I don't. Uh, and so I always encourage folks, you know, if, if your kids have, you know, soccer games and recitals, go. If you can go, go. I, I want you to go. Uh, you need some time to get out and go to the gym and exercise, go. I want you to. Um, but, you know, when it's time to, you know, if, if you know, General Dunlap comes in and says, hey, I, I'm sorry, but I need this, you know, by, by you know, in the morning, then we're going to stay in there and get it, get it done by in the morning. Um, and I, I, I think that has worked for me. I, I'm certainly not a good example of work-life balance, for sure, so I'll admit that. Um, but again, but, but just let me close on that point. Once you make the choice, live with it. So, for example, I know folks who say, you know, I don't want to work late. You know, I, I realize that's a big project the boss is, wants me to work on, but I, I don't want to do that. You know, OK, fine. No problem. But recognize, though, when the, the boss is looking for someone to promote 
or a big position comes open and and you don't get that uh okay and then don't complain about it just just be happy you know so just make your decisions and live with them uh there are you know and, and there will be some hard decisions you have to make uh but those are personal choices uh that we have to make so i, I think work-life balance is a little bit of a myth uh, a lot of people look at it as well i just want to be home all the time well okay th that that's the choice you have to make uh you're probably not going to be as successful as you might want to be like that but those that's a choice you have to make sir uh we could easily go on for another hour because there's all kinds of stuff and other questions i'm hoping maybe we can get you back again and what i'd really like to do is get you down here in person uh, Happy once, to. When, once things clear up because sure. Uh, the wisdom that you've shared with us today, and I just want to emphasize to everybody again, you've got to get this book and it's readable uh, because there's so many leadership lessons that you can and life lessons really that you can draw from the book and also from General Spencer's remarks. And I especially appreciate that that last part because I think you're 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 expressing tough love. You know, you're telling people really the way it is, and you're calling on people to be accountable for themselves. And and I think that your success is very reflective of that, that, you know, you held yourself accountable, you made your choices, you made the sacrifices, and you pushed through things that other people don't necessarily have to push through. And you became successful, you know, I don't know if we've ever had as a vice chief of staff a finance somebody who came up through the finance no. field. It's almost always been dominated by uh, the operators, and and not for bad reasons. Sure, sure. Uh, and that's a whole area that I'd like to explore with you uh, because I think there it speaks to 